They're doing this Streisand effect thing where he's like, Project 2025? Never heard of it. It's like everyone in your administration works for Project 2025. And then these secret videos come out and the Trump campaign spokesperson who's denying that there's any affiliation between the Trump campaign and Project 2025 worked for Project 2025. <laughs> right. She's in those videos too. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller, welcoming back uh, the co-host of the Politics Pod with Matt Iglesias, uh, the author of Off Message on Substack, a former editor of mine, Brian Boitler. What's happening, Brian? Not a whole lot. Uh, podcasting with you, which is fun. I kind of forgot that you'd edited me until I was looking at our text history. You're a good <laughs> editor. I'm, I'm, I'm easy to edit because I like editors that that make things better and you like to make things better i don't like editors that make things worse you know there's a lot of editors in uh my line of work our line of work now i guess that uh they're they're like you know at, this is actually true across yeah. professions and vocations it's like my job is this ergo when confronted with something that's what i'm going to do and sometimes it's just not necessary right or yeah. like maybe don't only take out my pulp of, fiction references yeah. all right don't take <laughs> them out they're in there for a fucking reason don't try to turn me into richard cohen the, I, I now I can't even remember, but there was somebody who made like an oblique reference to something that happened in the TV show 24 in the piece. And I'm like, I know I'm I know I'm like of a certain age and don't get a lot of pop culture references, but that's a reference I should get. Yeah. And the fact that I don't means uh, that nobody's gonna. It. And so I had to cut that one. But yeah, whatever, man, if you're if you're trying to signal to your nerdy Simpsons friends and want to throw a reference to that in there, I'm yeah. good with it. Come on. All right. We uh I mostly want to talk about you had a you had a column in your subsect this week. Mm -hmm. Uh you're like the chief vibesologist out there, uh arguing that the Democrats should focus more about making the vibes good and a little less on policy, despite the fact that you are significantly to my left policy wise. So we're gonna argue about policy. We're gonna argue <laughs> about vibes. But yeah. before that, you know, we gotta talk about the news. Donald Trump last night in all of his genius, um, was uh, um, had some remarks uh, in front of a group that included Miriam Adelson, Sheldon Adelson's uh, late wife, uh, who's a huge donor to him. The late Sheldon Adelson's wife. <laughs> what did I say? You said Sheldon Adelson's late, late wife, wife, which would mean that. <laughs> no, maybe leave she, it in. Yeah, maybe she's late. <laughs> maybe she's behind, uh, Cleo, like Cleopatra. Um, all right, uh, let's let's actually... I don't need to set it up. Let's just listen. Yeah, listen. I have to say, Miriam, uh, I watched Sheldon sitting so proud in the White House when we gave Miriam the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's the highest award you can get as a civilian. It's the equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor, but civilian version. It's actually much better because everyone gets the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's soldiers. They're either in very bad shape because they've been hit so many times by bullets or they're dead. She gets it, and she's a healthy, beautiful woman. It's very... And they're rated equal. They're rated equal. They're rated equal, but not really, <laughs> actually. The Medal of Freedom that you get for being a rich person that gives money to Donald Trump is actually superior to the Medal of Honor because you don't have war injuries, and you're not dead. You're not a sucker or a loser. Yeah, what you just need to have uh, billions of dollars of your own, or your inheritance needs to be large. And Donald Trump will give you the highest civilian honor in the land. It's wonderful. Like, what did she ever do to deserve a medal of any kind? I don't, I don't think anything. I, she was a doctor. Maybe she did some good doctoring. Uh, I didn't before know she started don Yeah, before she started donating to uh, really noxious causes. But interestingly about this, Bill Crystal wrote about it at length in, in, in Morning Shots this morning. Folks haven't signed up for our newsletter. The, uh, you know, the, there's the John Kelly controversy, right, where, where – uh, you know, John Kelly says that Donald Trump uh, told him that you know the people that died uh, at uh, you know that they're that they're visiting the you know soldiers' gravestones said that they were suckers and losers. What did they get out of this? Um, and uh, you know, John Kelly's son had uh, was a veteran who died uh, in war, and so you know it was maybe an insensitive comment in the micro and in the macro uh, in that instance. And uh, but Trump's been denying this right for. Years. He also, John Kelly also reported that Trump did not want to have uh, amputees, people that had been injured in war, uh, to be photographed with him because 
you know, it messes with the juju. Uh, people don't want to like to look at that. We have to, you know, make those people lepers and put them far away. Um, and uh, and so Trump has been denying this for years. He denied it, I believe, in the first debate. It was one of the overshadowed moments of the first debate, but um, he denied it and said he never said that. That's a lie. And here he is honoring Miriam Adelson basically saying that right like you can get that you can get the medals that these losers get uh but without the injuries you know as long as you're just nice to the president and give them money uh i mean he did this in public with john mccain in 2015 or 2016 when he said like i'd like people who weren't shot down right um so i mean that's why when john kelly came forward with this one john kelly has more credibility than donald trump so yeah. very low bar to clear. But B, he was saying something that was consistent with what we knew about Donald Trump to, already at that point. And so now it's like re reconfirmed. And, you know, I think that this this works in two ways or like we're we're seeing like a, the, the the immediate effect, which is that everyone's kind of desensitized to it. And so it's, it's not like generating front page headlines or. You know, it's it's, it's going to be out of the new, yeah, it's going to be out of well, yeah, but it's going to be out of the news cycle in a day or yeah. two, probably, right? Um, yeah. Where where if you know Kamala Harris said something like this, it would dominate the news cycle for a long time, and that's frustrating because there should be one standard for everyone who wants to be president, right? Um, but I think separately, um, it's like I think we're seeing Joe Biden's theory of the election um, being vindicated, uh, and he was basically like. When people remember the things they didn't like about Trump, I will pull ahead and then um, Democrats will win the election. And it just required Joe Biden to drop out. So <laughs> he and his baggage one can get flaw out of, with that theory yeah. of the election. One minor so the, flaw. But so that people could be reminded of the Trump they hated instead of only seeing the Trump that they could kind of like hold their nose and tolerate. And so because we're not going to get days and days and days of uh, like roadblock news coverage of this event, I don't think it's going to have an enormous impact on his polling. Like, and the bottom basically never falls out from under Trump's approval. I guess like maybe after January 6th, it dipped a lot and then he was out of office. So people stopped measuring approval ratings, but even absent an insurrection, he can get like plum 40, 39, 38% on the basis of just being an asshole. Um, and, uh, like he's at what, like 46, 45 now it's, yeah. it's kind of like the high water mark for him. You yeah, know, he's and got these... room to go down. It was interesting. Yes. That New York times Siena poll. He was at that, that phrase is right. He was at his high water mark in the New York times Siena poll history at 40. I forget if it was 46 or 47% favorable. It was the highest favorability rating he'd have. Yeah. And these are the sorts of things where like, you know, you'd like to think that he says something like this and it's over the Trump problem is solved because he just discredited himself and everyone's like wait what a gross person how could i have ever supported him it doesn't work like that unfortunately but these are the sorts of things that add up and that you you could imagine dragging trump from an august high of 45 46 percent approval down to a hopefully like a november you know reversion to the mean of 40 41 percent and that's where he needs to be to really be creamed in this election and obviously that would be good for the country uh, what do you think about his press conference yesterday, um, or, or take it any way you want, or the media coverage of it? And the media showed CNN showed about thirty minutes of him rambling before cutting away and then cutting back to the questions. Uh, the, most of the questions were from like MAGA media outlets, so it wasn't exactly like he was taking any hard questions yesterday either. Uh, but he drives no message. He's rambling. Uh, he's obviously aggrieved about Kamala. I have some notes here. He made fun of the fact that people don't know her last name. He's still obsessed over how she looked too pretty on the on the Time cover. He said she complains too much. Just a little bit of projection, maybe. He said very strong communist lean, and then then said way beyond socialism. He's mad. She called him weird. I. I I mean, what? What? I, I think the Trump theory of the case is that he wants attention back from her, and so he's going to have these rambling things and get attention. Uh, but to what end? I guess. I think I. Well, first, I, it's interesting to me because I tuned out after those thirty minutes, and everyone started cutting away, and I'm just like, "What's the point of this? Is is his new thing now that he holds quote unquote press conferences, but he makes sure that MAGA media outlets are among the press yeah. pool, and then he just selects them so that he can pretend he had a." like a real press conference, but it's really just like, a okay, that's clever, I guess. Um, 
uh, I think the idea related to that. There were one or two that- hard questions. If we're going to just be fair, that we we you know we call it straight here, Brian. <laughs> I think that Garrett Hake got a question in. Okay, I, there were one right. or two normals that got questions in, but there was also why has God chosen you? I believe was a question, <laughs> and um, and you know there were yeah. a couple on why the Biden Harris economy is so terrible, but like no questions about did you take a ten million dollar bribe from Egypt and no, cover it up? I didn't. I th- I think the the higher purpose, like the thing that uh, allows him in. Um, Chris Lasavita and maybe now Corey Lewandowski to be of one mind about this is that Trump wants the attention. Um, Trump wants to reassert control over the narrative of the election because he's been unable to do it since Harris got in. They want Harris to have more media scrutiny. And so putting Trump out there to do a quote unquote press conference allows him to say, Donald Trump's done two press conferences in two weeks. Where's Kamala? Right. All right. Is any of that working though? They have no. A, it's not working. Like she keeps going up in the polls. Um, I think eventually she will do a regular press conference. It's just a weird, you know. Like w- there's no template for this. She took over a campaign with little notice in July and had to, you know, choose a VP, pick a choose a running mate, <laughs> yeah. and 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 re redesign the whole convention that's next week. So it's like it. It's 21 days. Well, the last time this happened, it was 19 days. No, there was no last time, right? right? Like we're, we're just making this up on the fly. Um, and But I think that they think, or they hope at least, that the caricature they've drawn of Harris as somebody who can only uh, be articulate and compelling when on teleprompter is she'll, she'll be forced to do an interview or a, a press conference or both, and she'll melt down, and then they'll be able to like, reset the narrative of the race again in one uh, in a place that's more favorable to them or less favorable to her. Um, I feel like she through campaign aides or whoever should could easily just explain like all this stuff happened kind of out of nowhere. We need to run the campaign, get it set up and and prepared for September and October. As soon as that's done, we'll do a press conference. Yeah. B- but also, like when I when we do the press conference, you can take my answers to the bank. It is easy for somebody who doesn't care about being honest or factual or whether he misleads people to have a press conference every day of the week. There won't be no, there won't be to- a long rant about how I didn't yes. jail Hillary Clinton w- when I could have because it's uh, you know for some reason I believe that the president is indistinguishable from the dictator of Belarus. And I can just yeah. j- jail political opponents or not based on my mercy and whims. You know, that right, was a, exactly. It was like an eight minute aside during a <laughs> quote unquote press conference about him. His yeah, imaginary, it, his imaginary jailing powers that he didn't use. Well, and, and like, you know, she is not going to um, like just make wild assertions about him that aren't true or about her record that aren't true. You know, she will spin because right. she's a politician. But the the casual slander that comes with Trump and his campaign just isn't a part of democratic politics, at least not at the level of presidential elections. And so it will be a, subst- a substantive press conference. Like the people who attend it or who cover it will be able to mine her answers for whatever they're interested in yeah. and have at least some confidence that what she says is corresponds to reality in some way if i were her i would just want that idea out there in the discourse um that like what you're getting from donald trump are sort of potemkin press conferences everyone kind of rolls their eyes at the lies he tells and the random bizarre things that he says and they pluck the one kind of normal thing that he set out and and uh, that becomes the headline to like my eternal frustration and she should want in the discourse like if, if, if you want me to hold a press conference to do that, I'm happy to do it. I could do that every day of the week. But I, I think what you really want is honest, informed answers from somebody who, who can be entrusted to the presidency. And I will fit that into my schedule when I can. Yeah, right. Um, one other uh, related to Donald Trump giving answers that, is, that are not, uh, don't, do not correspond with the real reality of his plans um there was a uh, secret video you know i'm of mixed views about secret audios and sometimes you know i i get i get a little i get a little weak need sometimes about the secret audio but we do have some secret audio of russ vaught who is the uh, kind of the guy that has been bestowed upon as you know, the policy heavyweight of MAGA world. And he's the person that's like, I guess everybody points to that is in charge of backfilling Donald Trump's rambling rants 
uh, and creating some kind of policy apparatus or, or, around them. Bannon always talks about Russ Vaught as you know, kind of the intellectual heavyweight of MAGA. Um, he was deeply involved in Project 2025. Uh, he got tricked by some Brits. And um, here he is talking about Trump and abortion policy. The president's actually come up with a, a strategy that works so long as you are giving people like me in the government the ability to, to block funding for Planned Parenthood, block funding for fetal tissue research. But what I've told people is, he had the most pro-life record ever. I've never seen him take a, to stand in the way of a pro-life initiative yeah. that actually was real yeah. politically and with momentum. It's a great plan as long as you just don't say it out loud. It's just like, let Donald Trump pretend he's basically pro choice. Yeah. And then put a bunch of weirdo Russ Vaught people in HHS and let them use every arcane lever possible to block any access to women's reproductive care. I love how this whole Project 2025 thing has played out as like, you know, it's it's not that much different from how Republicans assemble their agenda in more normal times. It's just been outsourced to think tanks and stuff. Um, but, you know, um, it was it's never been uncommon for Republicans to have like a, a, a policy um, like guidebook that's, you know, several hundred pages long, filled with stuff that they really rather not talk about that much. And then Democrats say, oh, look, this is your plan to push granny off a cliff or whatever. And Republicans say, no, 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 that's not really what we're about. And then it's this kind of tussle like that, that Trump's um, main insight was if you outsource that to to heritage then you can create some distance from it and his real but, insight, but, 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 his but then so was in 2020 it didn't work in the end but the insight was like why do we have a platform at all right we'll just that say that it's whatever right donald trump did. wants right and and uh but i love that like so democrats and liberals and just every, anyone who like has the correct read on trump's character is like this is bullshit this is, this is your transition and and governing plan you don't have anything else that you can work with. And so it's obviously going to be this. And Trump says, no, no, no. And then Russell Vaught, like gets a camera in front of him. He's like, no, that's actually literally yeah, that's the plan. The, um, what the libs and, have been saying, what the media has been saying, like that's the true thing. Yeah, that's yes. right. And it's actually really smart. It's actually really smart that we're tricking him. Like, yeah. Wait, wait. You know? And I, I like, they, they have been so ham handed about this because like, I feel like there's two viable options if this is your agenda and it's so yeah. unpopular one is to just own it and just be like we right. we these principles are important yeah. and we are not going to run away from them and like even if you don't agree with them at least you can trust us to do what we say and say what we whatever yeah. um or and then the things uh, are great or you just say it as like what are you talking about all of that stuff is why things were so great when i was president you know do sure, all that I, and why things have gone so terrible under joe biden and like that and you know we'll take care of it but if you're not going to do that, then I think the thing to do is to just completely lie. Like if Donald Trump says, I reject the proposals of Project 2025, except for like these handful that I think yeah. are OK and like these are them. They're not nothing to be scared of there. And I will not appoint to my administration anyone who participated in the con job that is Project 2025, yeah. period. And then he wins the election. He just does it anyways. Like psych, right? Like that would be, I mean, he doesn't care about the truth. So why wouldn't he do that? That would at least fool a lot of people into thinking that he actually had like found this agenda to be alarming. And then he could just spring the reality on people after it was too late. Like at least that would throw more people off the scent. Instead, they're doing this dry sand effect thing where he's like, Project 2025, never heard of it. It's like everyone in your administration works for Project 2025. And then uh, these secret videos come out and the Trump campaign spokesperson who's denying that there's any affiliation between the Trump campaign and Project 2025 worked for Project 2025. Yeah, right. She's in those videos too. The method that they've chosen to try to dodge political heat for this thing just forces people who work in ambush journalism and traditional journalism and activism and whatever to, to like relay the whole thing bare. And it, it's just dragging it out so much longer and so much more painfully than it would be if you either just owned it or completely lied about it. Like Let's completely talk lied about, about it. the benefit of luck. And I just, you almost don't want to jinx these things because Trump had this insane run of good luck. And then it, it does feel like that, you know, the horseshoes flipped a little bit and on this stuff, like the whole project 2025 thing, I was deeply skeptical was going to be a successful political strategy because, you know, at the beginning, 
the Democrats, or rightly, and not less the Democrats, like journalists were rightly talking about the fact that the biggest threat here is the Schedule F and kind of the way that he wants to put his own Goombas into what used to be career career mm-hmm. government jobs for experts. Like that's like the, the thrust of this thing. And and that's like a very arcane thing to run on in a campaign, right? Uh, most people think that presidents can just pick whoever they yeah. want, right? So I guess like, you have to educate people before you tell them why it's bad. As, and, and then what happens is Biden has this disastrous debate and, and the Biden team is just like grasping around for anything to talk about. And it's like, don't talk about the debate. Talk about Project 2025. You know, talk about Project 2025. And it was, it was kind of a desperate ploy. Let's just be honest. But it worked because, you know, that, that's how you get stuff into the news environment as campaigns. This is a Brian, this is a Brian Boitler hobby horse. We're well. talking about things a lot. And so they get it into the, they get it into the news environment. And then Donald Trump and Chris Lasavita just fucking walk right into the trap by being like, oh, that's not us. And then Biden leaves anyway. And now Harris comes in to this environment where she can like run on, hey, this is their extreme policy book that you all have heard about now. Because we mm-hmm. talked about it the last three weeks, and like things just really fell into place. Like this was not a master plan. It's just yeah. like things just fell into place. So I think on the point about homing in on the Project Twenty Twenty Five Schedule F plan, yeah. I like I agree with you that like most people aren't going to Schedule F. What the fuck is that? Who yeah. cares? It is, I think, a good way to get elites on the broad center left, people who have worked in government, who do Aligned. work in government, who. And just like they know that that's important and that yeah. gets them really concerned about what's going to happen if Trump wins and then they go out and scare up votes however that's a good they point. can. So you know, the I don't think that that's like various like a, activist groups and like, total, you like, know, yeah, right. yeah. like if, if they're like, holy, sh- holy shit, they're going to use the, the, yes. the Comstock Act. Is that what it's called? Yeah, right. to, to, you know, like that's motivating to a class of people who have a lot of influence. And so I think you get the Vox certain- videos with 3 million views are like, what's the Comstock act, right? Like but, this is, but, but this here's is, where this the- is something that really works on the center left much more than on the center right. <laughs> here's, here's where project 2025 really does validate vibesology uh, or vibes theory, whatever yeah. you want to call it, is that they called it project 2025. <laughs> yeah. Like when you were working in Republican politics, the Paul Ryan budgets were called things like the pathway to prosperity and the roadmap to America's future. You know, like, yeah. like cliched, yes. hackney, the like lame, reduction but, act, <laughs> but to- totally to- like that sounds Contract pleasant with America. I like the idea of an American future. I love prosperity. Like who's to like who is going to look askance at this? But they're like, let's call it Project Twenty Twenty Five, and it's like it it sounds sinister, you know, like yeah. intelligence and agencies and military. They, they made they made merch, you know. It's like and, the videos people are like pictures of people at Reagan Airport, like these center left people you're talking about. They're like, look and, at this. This guy's they, got a Project Twenty Twenty Five back, like briefcase. They made videos <laughs> that were basically like. Under Project 2025, don't write any emails. <laughs> right. Go meet in private to discuss your plans to do illegal things and then just do them so that there is no paper trail. <laughs> that's Project 2025. And it's like, of course, that's going to go viral. Yeah, of right. course, it's going to go right. And like, I honestly feel like this election could look a lot different. I mean, probably by one or two points or something, but that's the ball game. maybe if they had called it uh, like, um, you know, something that... Uh, like a replacement level Republican operative working right. in Mike Johnson's office could have right. come up with roadmap to his success. Yeah. Done, right. you know, <laughs> but no, they called it like this, well, like bond, a, bond villain thing. And now, now they're and it is like the weirdest people. There is a, so this is like something that I try to like, educate my lefty friends about uh, you know because there's a theory of the case it's like all these republicans are all have always been weird and crazy and extreme and there's you know whatever there's something to all that but like there's this self-selecting adam smith nature of what's happening now nine years into the trump world right where like the type of person that would be in the room they'd be like let's call this you know project to prosperity like they've self-selected out our buddy brendan buck you know they, he works yeah. at a he works at a corporate pr firm now <laughs> doing public affairs <laughs> like these guys yeah. my buddy michael Steele. these guys the smart like, operative t- types i don't know they've if you remember self, over nine years they've been like we've self-selected out and the weirdest people in the entire you know conservative ecosystem have now risen to the top right because they're like hell yeah like i you know i i you, they can either get more power now 
because all the all the and smart people are gone or because they were always extremists and like now i can get my like race science hobby horse into the document right like and so that is another thing that happened like the project 2025 crew is very strange the new the new republican like operative class like they love cosplaying they're like from the internet right, right. do you remember when the snowden disclosures started rolling out and they detailed like nsa programs like prism you know and yeah, right. like and you know, I, when you get into the details, you can you, you can uh, like or dislike the plans. You can question their legal footing. You can think that they represent some shady activity that the U.S. government is up to. Um, but like Prism was just you know some internal term to describe a program. If they were if they were devising that plan or or, or designing that plan for public release, mm-hmm. they would have called it something normal, like right. protecting America from whatever. Yeah, right. uh, Radical. And Islam. and so it, it leaks and it's called prism and it sounds super cloak and dagger. And the people who run Republican messaging now think that that shit is cool. You know, yeah, they're right. like and they, they want to pretend like they're in some sort of like scheme yeah. to uh, to, you know, I, I don't know, like to dismantle like, the administrative. Yeah, state. it's just like like, like a final death blow to the administrative state. Unironically, like without yeah. any without they don't do the Dr. Evil finger when they say it. Like, that's just kind of what they say. It's like the J.D. Vance video we played yesterday with Mikey Sherrill of him and that guy. They're on the podcast. And instead of just being like, hey, we love when our in-laws come and help with the kids. It's like it has to be about how like post menstrual women of Indian descent are particularly well suited to this task. You know, it's like that guy that JD Vance was interviewing with. He's in the you know he's the type of person that's in Project Twenty Twenty Five. Yeah, I mean, I, I could do a whole episode with you about like like how JD Vance is like what you get when the Republican Party tent poles are like keep ta- like low taxes, no 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 money for yeah. social services. Christian conservatism, and then the third one, instead of being like military stuff, national yeah. defense spending stuff, it's anti-immigration stuff, right? Yeah. When you assemble all of that, you get somebody like J.D. Vance, who's like, we need to replenish American population after we kick out the immigrants right. by making turning Whites. like women into baby makers. Yeah. And um, But we don't want the wrong kinds of people having babies, so there's not going to be any money for them, and you're going to have to bring your grandma in to help raise the (laughs) kids, right? Like that's the that's That's the vision. But like it, uh, but it attracts people like Vance who believe in all of it, and then they have a really weird way of talking about. I mean, and all because it's gross. Like the the vision for the country that it it represents is unappealing. Um, But like it turns out, it's also very hard to talk about in a way that is attractive to, yeah, to because it is already weird. bought in. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. Okay. We're, let's get to your, uh, let's get to your vibesology theory of the case. I, I okay. want to just set the table for people who are not deep listeners of your podcast with Matt Iglesias, um, politics, which, which they should be. You are on this vibe side of politics that the Democrats should care more about trying to control the media battle space. Matt is more on the side of actually no policy positions really matter. Voter, voter behavior is a lot based on policy positions. Um, you wrote earlier this week, uh, Kamala Harris's rise refutes an influential democratic theory of politics, which is is the map theory. Um, and, uh, you highlight in particular, uh, what we can now see clearly is that economic sentiment among voters to some important extent forms downstream of political optimism, which in turn is a function of mass psychology. So your argument is that the, the the polling showing not just that Kamala Harris is doing better, better, but the people feel better about the economy despite the fact that she hasn't actually changed any policy views on anything uh, is evidence that it's more about vibes than policy. Is that a good summary? That's a really good. Yeah, that's a good summary. I would, I would, I would say like two small things, not really as correctives, but just as addenda, sure. I, you know, as Matt and I have done the show for longer, we don't exactly disagree with each other. It's just a question of emphasis. Um, yeah. Like I think that the right policy approach for Democrats to take when when trying to win campaigns is don't do stupid shit. It's like the old Obama line about foreign policy It's like, as long as you are not touching third rails constantly, you're fine. Like people are not going to delve into the details that much. They want to know what your values are and what direction that points policy wise in a vague sense. You can say you support a higher minimum wage. And then that can mean, you know, literally the minimum wage goes up or you support various other, you know, full employment to, to pressure wages up, whatever, right? Like it doesn't, you don't need to write it all down. And if you do write it all down, it's not going to 
change your polling because people are just not tuned in at that level in general. Right. The second thing, anti, this is, let's just say, cause I'm sure you like your policies and I don't. So this is nothing about the policies, but this is the anti Elizabeth Warren. Right. This yeah. is the anti, I, I, the, I have a plan for that. Theory. Well, I think it's, 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 yeah. it's like, it's the anti 2008 primary. Um, like in 2008, yeah, John Edwards, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, all, and others all trying to outcompete each other for policy detail yeah. and to outflank each other in ambition. Yeah. Um, and it was demanded by people like Matt, <laughs> like they wanted to see these details. And now I think that like, a, that went too far. It and B, true. The it's only just thing like, that mattered was we, that Barack got, Obama it, was Hopi Changy and he seemed cool. Yes, and it, was it like, got reinterpreted. That's what really matters. It got reinterpreted as like good policy is good politics. Therefore, really like master your policy, be super detailed yeah. about it, and the good politics will follow. And I think that that's basically wrong. Yeah. And it's not that Matt yeah, it's disagrees. It's like quick with, quiz. Who is for the individual mandate between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama? <laughs> right, like only I mean, people, I know the answer. But I know yeah. only people that were in the blogosphere in 2008 know the answer to that. But that was like the prime debate question, and it ended up mattering right. like basically zero. And, and obviously, did not ob- actually impact the policy that Obamacare ended up being. And on the, on the flip side of that, like obviously Matt agrees that – controlling the information space with things that are favorable to your side, like Donald Trump's corruption or whatever are better than the, you know, the alternative. So like we, it's not like we think that each other has uh, like um, directionally incorrect views about this stuff. Just that like, what should Democrats be spending their efforts on to maximize the, and I think it's this like aesthetic stuff, this like, like the impressions people form. Right. So the, the, the second caveat I want to offer is that um, we're recording this what Friday, August 16th. So yeah. the Michigan consumer sentiment index should be updated today. And it will either like, I'll either have a little bit of egg on my face or I will be, <laughs> I'll be uh, vindicated. I think it's the expectations are, it's not going to come in too hot. And if it comes in, if it spikes, I think it's, it's another um, data point in my favor, but the, like the way the well, reason what was I the think data, before you talk about the data that might sure. not turn out in your favor, what was the data that, that, oh, that premised I, the, the article? Yes. So, so, you know, Kamala Harris takes over from Biden. Economic policy does not change. The underlying economy does not change. If it, it does maybe a little bit, like it seems like it's weakening a little bit. So you would expect that to correlate, if anything, to Democrats doing worse. But then she takes over and she gets an immediate spike in the polls based on just being a different person. Um, and then another thing happens. She overtakes Donald Trump in the financial times survey of like, who do you trust more in the economy? And like Biden had been trailing all the way, all, like the whole way through his campaign. Again, nobody knew what her, like what changes she was going to make to the Biden policy agenda. And Biden had not changed policy from the white house and the underlying economy or underlying economy hadn't changed. People just were like, I am more comfortable with this lady than I was with the other old guy. And I'm, I'm more comfortable with her than I am with the alternative, the, the orange faced old guy. Right. Like right. that was, that was it. And then there was a, a, a separate consumer sentiment index that um, it's one month of data, but it spiked faster in July than any month in the history of the survey. So there was just a radical change in perception on yeah. the part of a subset of the population about the economy where they had been saying that they, their sentiment was weak and now they're saying it's strong. And I just feel like you don't need to be, a super empathic person to imagine why that might be right. Like, like you are, I'm guessing familiar with being in a bad mood, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, and, and it could, be, it could be, it could be Tuesday. It could be the environment is making you in a bad mood. And you can't quite put your finger on it. Or it could be like something in particular that just, it's just been a bad day of, of individual things happening that suck. Um, but it can make everything seem worse, right? Like the, like you're in a bad mood and your food tastes worse, even if it's the same food. Like, well, if, if like 20 or 30 or 50 percent of Democratic voters are despondent about Biden probably losing the election and maybe being too old to be president, and now suddenly you swap him out for Harris and she's young and exciting and they're excited, that could easily make lots of people feel better about all kinds of things, right? right. Like people's relationships with their families might have gotten better because they're less depressed about politics. Like, I don't think that that is... I, I, I have no psychological training, but I've been a human for 41 years, right. and I, I, I know how seemingly disconnected things can change my pers- per perspective on totally different things. And that's why, like, when I noticed her overtake Trump and I noticed this consumer sentiment index spike, I'm like, it's that. That's what's happening. Um, now, and- is it also just possible that 
that this is an outlier. My pushback to you is this, is that this is an outlier situation that the Democrats didn't really do anything besides like she gave a couple of good speeches. Um, and really what was happening was there was a, some subset of people, maybe 10%, maybe 30% of the country. And I'm not talking about the MAGA people, like some subset of either soft Republicans, soft Democrats, independents, some subset of people that just looked at Joe Biden and was like, this guy can't be in charge of anything effectively. I refuse to believe that he is. And so when I'm getting asked if things are going well in the country, I, I'm just saying no, because I yeah. just don't believe that, that, that a person, that this person is capable of making things go well in the country. That might be irrational or whatever, but like might have just have been that as simple as that an outlier. They're just, there was just people reflecting, like, I do not trust that the government is being run well right now. But that, that, I mean, that is a vibes theory that you just articulated, right? Yeah, like, but in a really I, extreme one, I guess. Yeah. Well, look, like, I, what I would say is that, like, a president winning, an incumbent president winning a basically uncontested primary and then declining the nomination after that's all over because he's losing and people have lost confidence in him and, and like offering his support to his much younger vice president is such a like extreme development. Like we've never, like we've never seen it before and we'll probably never see it again in our lifetimes. Right. And so it takes something of that magnitude to, to create this abrupt difference, you know, shooting up six to 8% in polls doesn't typically happen in a campaign. Um, and, and consumer sentiment spiking this fast doesn't typically happen except in periods of like serious economic turmoil. Right. But, um, it, there was just this radical change and it, I think it like what happened is what, how you described it, 10, 20% of the population came off the sidelines, stopped being double haters and just started feeling better about the direction of things where before they were using any question about whether they approved of Biden or how they felt about the economy as like a proxy for like, are things with this president going well? Right. And like their impression was no, right. because he's so old, he can't campaign, but it was not a, a material assessment of economic reality. Right. They yeah. weren't like, okay, man, you know, I, like I do feel pinched. I, 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 I am pinched. I, I can't yeah. afford my shit anymore. That wasn't what was happening. Like what was happening is they were despondent about Biden's vibe his his likelihood of winning his ability to serve f four terms and it bled into their economic sentiment and you know it's like i i i wish the world worked in the sort of mechanistic way that um my co-host and and many other democratic people who work in democratic strategy do it would make winning elections easy and meritorious you just do a good job and you win yeah. but it's not it's not how anything really works um the uh by the way i should have answered my own hypothetical for listeners who are annoyed it was hillary clinton that was for the individual yes. mandate to barack obama's for a public option um oh, but obama. obama did it right obama did it right obama did what i'm saying trump should do he said i we don't need an individual mandate and i don't support one right all yeah. the way through the election and then won the presidency and was like psych um, okay I, well i can't approve of that i just no it's at you, no it's obama. bad but um, he won <laughs> like, yeah but he won uh so okay I, my other pushback to you on this vibe theory okay. is Again, it's, this is this is kind of like why I got annoyed at Alan Lichtman with the thirteen keys, <laughs> where oh, he's God. like thirteen, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, that, like this, the N here is like two, right? Of, yeah. of times where presidents left, right? So the N here is like one, right? I, I, what is happening right now might support your theory, but it might not, right? Like household incomes are up, gas prices are down, mortgage rates are going down. People always said. I've been, you know, I've had economic experts on this podcast for months, so they're going to be lagging. People are, are going to have a lagging reaction to inflation coming down. They're not going to realize it for a while. It's, it takes time for people to get used to their prices. So, like, that happens. That is happening at the same time that there's this dramatic shift in the presidential race. I'm like, I don't, you know, if, if Biden had switched to Harris at a time when, uh, you know, where, where that one day stock market tank had actually been persistent for three weeks or gas prices are skyrocketing that probably the vibes probably couldn't have been able to overcome that right well maybe not i mean like he he flunked a debate in front of 50 million people right like it was yeah. it was a very traumatic episode it was um and look i think that what happens is in in like liberal political analysis is there's a uh a, a change in public opinion 
Joe Biden's approval rating is going down when it should be going up based on fundamentals. Economy's right. been growing for a long time, et cetera. And so then people go back, sift through the data and try to look for how to make the curve fit, right? right. And so they're like, oh, gas prices were up a little bit yeah, or right. real estate. <laughs> you know, uh, was persistently a little higher than and, the and target even the, number. Yeah. Even this idea that there's a lag effect where people remain mad about inflation is like, un, it's just a assertion. You know, it's like, it's, it's a way to try to make sense of something on the basis of like a, a, a intuition about how people might think about the economy. But basically you're, you're trying to, you're trying to, after the fact, backfill, reformulate what yeah. the fundamental, yeah, backfill, like reformulate what the fundamentals are to match what Biden's approval rating is. And I just think that like, that's a bad approach. Yeah. And, and, and the, and the Alan Lickman stuff, even though it, it sounds like vi it's prescriptivist, right? It's like, if, if these 12 things fall into place, the, yeah. the, the incumbent party candidate wins or something like that. And like, that's prescriptivist in much the same way that um, like good policies, good politics theory is prescriptivist. It's just like, do these things right. And the politics will fall into place. The elections will fall into place. And the, like a cornerstone of vibes theory is that there's no set of things that you can predictably do that will predictably deliver you yeah. election victories I can just you have to the vibes. you have to you have to be like it's 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 you the year 2024 vibes better people, or their vibes people, worse. people have rumor mills in their pockets and that yeah. they check dozens of times a day for updates on what's happening in the world yeah. and you need to fill that rumor mill with stuff that's good for you so that they feel a way that makes them inclined to vote for you and i can't tell you day by day what the right way to do that is let alone like write up a plan that's going to work election after election. Um, and like nothing that I'm saying here should make like mislead anyone listening into thinking that I don't care about whether policy is well implemented or well designed. I do. And like, if you are a re if you are really bad at policy and governing, you are going to suffer politically from it. You should yes. like, but those are like the table stakes. You should get into politics because you want to govern well, and then you should govern well because it's the right thing to do. And because if you govern poorly, you'll lose. Right. But that's that. That's governing. And then separately over here, there's politics. And it's it's like trying to figure out whether Trump took a bribe from CC is, is like good for accountability. There's a substantive reason to do it. But it's because if people are thinking about Donald Trump takes bribes from from Gulf state dictators or Arab uh, um, like Arab dictators, like that's valuable politics for Democrats. Yeah. And yeah. they shouldn't they shouldn't sit on stuff like that, but they choose to. I'd I agree. Well, the one thing we won't go into this because it's boring because we agree, which is both of us are like leading the flag waving of where are the where is the Democratic Senate investigative and oversight committees? What the fuck are they doing? Why aren't they? Why are not like random Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, intelligence officials being called before our Congress so that we can have news about this. We totally agree on this. I think it's, I think it's been a total abdication of Democrats on this point, like across 20 Amen. verticals. Um, all right. Let's just talk about governing for one second though, because we have to, let's just okay. be serious for one second. Cause Kamala's rolling out her econ, econ policy today. It includes Nicaraguan style price controls. Apparently, <laughs> we'll see. Come. We'll see what the details are. It also includes giving people cash to buy a home, as if really the right if this is the right solution to our housing crisis and the and the high cost of homes is to give people more money that they can then use to pay for homes. That's somehow going to lower the price of housing for people. Un unclear exactly how that works. Why are we doing this? Like, why do we have to do this? Like. Can you explain to me the progressive yeah. mind that forces yeah. us to do this? Sure. Can't we just do She has a couple good things in there, I should say. Three million more housing units. Awesome. Child tax credit. Awesome. Why do we have to do the socialist stuff? <laughs> um, I think what you should, you should see this as a recognition from the Democratic Brain Trust. Yeah that the stakes of the election are too great to get bogged down in like internecine policy spats. Because if this, if she put out these plans during a primary, a democratic yeah. primary, somebody else in the primary would be like the, the economics don't work or, yeah, or right. like this, these are bad ideas. And then she'd have to defend them and whatever. I think what she's done and I I'm cribbing from Julian Sanchez. He's okay. who's now on Substack. He's got, awesome. a, it's called um, non-content is the name of his newsletter, but he, analogize what she's doing to vaccination where you take like a, a a tiny amount of something that's harmful and you inoculate 
uh, a body against it. And so it doesn't do any harm itself, but it's protective is that these are not, um, these are not full socialism plans. These are like, um, like, uh, carefully selected, uh, policy nostrums that are very popular, okay. um, but designed in a way not to do any damage so that you gain all of the popular appeal of doing things that pull well without committing yourself to a course of action that's going to actually cause a lot of damage. Um, you know what else so, is really popular? That's never going to happen? <laughs> Balancing the budget. So why don't we do that, too? Why, well, don't but, but, okay. why don't you throw the Wall Street, why don't you throw the Paul Ryan, you know, Atlanta suburbs I mean, voters a little bit? Like, we'll do you, a little popular socialism, I, we'll do some price controls, we'll do some balanced budgeting, and whatever. I, mean, I like, think, where, I think, I, 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 game because, because Kamala Harris isn't a Republican, right? Like, <laughs> Like she, so? if she's going to, if she's going to lock herself Is into, she a socialist? no, but what she, like, I think what she wants to, to, to signal is I have some policy ideas that will help bring costs of stuff down. Yeah. And then she's going to put herself onto a trajectory to do those in ways that are acceptable to liberals, people on the, from the center to the left. Okay. Um, and she doesn't want to lock herself into something like I support a balanced budget that will get her locked <laughs> into a policy direction. That's like, well, now I've got to cut Medicare and also raise okay. taxes. Like she does, you know, but uh, we're not really going to have price controls. We're not like, there's well, not I mean, be somebody she, she's not FTC, like calling the Kroger, letting them know that their that their oatmeal is a little overpriced. Like, that's e- even not if she right? tried, like she is not going to pack that Supreme court <laughs> fast <laughs> enough to do anything like what you're talking about. Right. Uh, um, and, and look, like here's another, here's another, it would be, it would be great if elections were really just like contests of ideas. And then Harris put out a detailed plan and Trump put out a detailed plan. And that's, you just showed that to voters and you let them pick, but that's not obviously like a, a model that, that works. Um, I don't think you're going to see a whole infrastructure of like liberal or left wing economists and policymakers developing new think tanks and stuff so that they can talk about how wonderful these ideas are and how they fit into a philosophy called Harrisism, right? Okay. Like you, you are going to have plenty of elite liberals um, like us kind of saying, yeah, these are not like super well crafted ideas. Um, but they're also devised in a way to do little harm and, and they're popular. So let's just give her space to run her campaign because at the moment, pick a Yoon spats about policy are just not that important. She needs to win because Trump needs to be stopped because democracy needs yeah. to be saved. And, and like the, the fact that this is basically going to get a thumbs up or a like thumb sideways from everyone in, in, like the liberal elite uh, is just a testament to the fact that we all are on, I think the same page about that. Like let's have a little bit of uh, grace here and not bog her down in our um, like intellectual vanity because like there are things more important about the, right now than whether your housing policy design is going to uh, cause prices to, be warped we're by subsidize. We're just gonna subsidize and blah. You know, like subsidize who cares? Demand, subsidize demand. Subsidize demand. Subsidize right. demand. It'll keep working. Just keep doing yeah. it. Eventually, it'll work. Um, okay, so, it's but, fine. It's look, fine. I'm just. I'm going to take a deep breath today. I will say your speech. It's fine. I I will say that this is like not ideal, and it may not even be an optimal way to go about policy under these extremely weird circumstances. But I think it's closer to the mark than the approach we talked about a few minutes ago, where where. Democrats essentially alone are expected to offer insane levels of specificity yeah, right. um, about things that they can't credibly promise because right. the details are Congress's job. And so, like, I think it's fine to gesture in the direction of the things you want to do and, and to be clear about your values and then say that the details will be sorted out with your elected representatives. And like, ideally, the the starting point of that are I are our are, are values and ideas we're, we're not talking about, well, this sounds like price controls and that's bad. It's like, it's ideas that from the, from the kernel, we yeah. can, we're just we going after behind. the gougers. We're just, but we don't know who they are. We're not saying fine. who they are. We're just saying if you're gouging top cop combo is coming. I mean, you. I mean, it, it is, it is sort of like an economic populist version of saying of what Republicans are doing with like, we're going to illegalize um, immigrants from voting. It's like, that's already illegal, yeah, but they're right. just, you know, like, it's just yeah. a, it's just a way of, signaling that this is something that you care about. Unfortunately, what they're doing is signaling that you should try to overturn the 2024 election yeah. if Trump loses. But like that is as a, as a, as a, um, uh, like a template for 
where policy fits into the elections firmament. It's like, just give them a morsel that tells them what your values are and, and like, let them persuade you that they're credible people who aren't trying to mislead you. And if, if they give you those things and, 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 you know, you support that direction, then that's your candidate. Right. It's, it's like not, it's not much more than that. I don't I'm think. not going to make too big of a stink out of it, but I've got a side eye on it. Okay. Last <laughs> thing before I lose okay. you. Um, Amanda Carpenter was talking on this podcast on Tuesday about how she thinks Donald Trump has PTSD and it's mm -hmm. why he's, it's part of the reason why he's so grumpy and his press conferences. So just putting aside all the insanity of the content, just like as a close Trump watcher, uh, his performance is as bad as it's ever been. It's a low ebb. Mm -hmm. it's, it could be his old, could be PTSD. Me, neither me nor Amanda have ever been shot. You have mm -hmm. been shot. And so I'm just wondering if you have any insights into what's happening in Donald Trump's brain. I don't for two reasons. Um, one is that um, maybe you should just tell people. Like, what yeah. Happens. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was like a, 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 a an aborted mugging, um, like 2008, however many years ago that was 16. 16 years ago. Good Lord. 16, yeah. um, and uh, so I ended up getting shot three times by like a, a street mugger who wanted to steal my phone and then they ran away. Um, uh, I survived. Uh, I lost my spleen, but I basically made a full recovery. Do you um, need a spleen or sp a spleen? You don't need it. No. Yeah. Um, it, it, it confers some, um, immunity to various encapsulated bacteria. It's a totally different mm. conversation. So I have to get like pneumonia vaccines. Um, yeah. but that's, that's basically it. Um, so it was such an out of sample event and it was so abrupt and I was young, I was 25. And yeah. so I recovered quickly. Uh, I, it, so it didn't traumatize me in the way that made me scared to just keep living my life. Um, and I'm not like trying to say that I'm like super resilient yeah. or immune to but PTSD. Nothing walking just, down the street. I guess my I was, I was kind of cheeky. My more specific question is the news is out today that he's going to start doing outdoor rallies again with, with mm -hmm. bulletproof vests, with bulletproof glass in front of him. Run. He's been in his home weirdly for two weeks. Like he's only had like one event outside of one of his homes. Uh -huh. So I do wonder, was that like a thing? Like walking down streets? Did you avoid certain streets? I never know. I... I, I definitely had like anger toward the people who the the kid who did it to me and his, yeah, sure. he was with a friend. Uh, and like, you know, I, like I would indulge these like revenge fantasies when I was feeling down, but I never, when I got out of the hospital, it was just like, that was like being struck by lightning. And if you're struck by lightning, you can live the rest of your life in a Faraday cage or you can just get back to it. And right. I, I resolved to get back to it and I'd never had flashbacks or nightmares or anything like that. So I I'm lucky in that regard. Um, I would assume total armchair psychology, but yeah. like Trump is such a, a narcissistic sociopath that like, as long as it didn't really hurt him, let alone kill him, you'd think he'd be like, Oh, that was weird. And then right. he's just back to it because all that matters is like whether he's present and alive in the moment and cause he's yeah. the center of the world. Um, but I think that it's a, like, like I, even though I have no personal experience with PTSD over my shooting and like the actual bullets pierced my body on like whatever the yeah. fuck happened to Donald Trump, but, uh, uh, was pierced. Is, is scraped um by some by a by a fragment i don't know who knows i'm gonna be a conspiracy theorist about this till till i see a, a report from his physicians but um uh i like i am aware that people who go through what i went through it really does like force them to make major changes in how they live their lives and that's totally reasonable um and maybe i'm wrong about like how how that impacts somebody with Trump's weird psychological disposition. Um, but if, if it turns out that he really has been at home for the last month and a half because he's, um, he's traumatized by it, like mate would, would fit the facts very well. Um, I think yeah. it's a good theory. Uh, the problem with Trump is that like, he, he'll never tell us. He thinks he's also Trump brought in that the final thing is he's brought in his buddies. You mentioned earlier, Corey Lewandowski, the, the bad breath one that one time mm -hmm. that bragged uh, that he murdered two people when he was trying to pick up a married woman at an addiction awareness fundraiser at a Benihana, um, you know, he likes to talk shop with Trump and Trump's brought him and a couple of other buddies in. I don't know. Maybe they're trauma blankets. Maybe well, I just, I, I just feel like, look, Trump is never going to tell us because he thinks yes. trauma is weakness. He's not transparent about any of his health yeah. issues. And um, he also just doesn't understand how to appeal to like regular people on a soft basis, everything has to be aggression. Right? right. And like, if he was able to 
reckon, like be honest with himself about what's happening. And if he told himself, I have trauma from this attempted assassination and went and talked publicly about it in, in human terms, this has been really hard. It's been harder than I expected. I've been slow to get back on the campaign trail because I've wanted to be sure that I'm safe. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, people would, pe that's the thing that people thought was going to happen. Like, yeah. When people were like, oh, he got shot. He's going to be a mark. Like he's got his polos are going to yeah. rise. Like the assumption was that people were going to have sympathy for him, but you, you have to be a sympathetic person Yeah, and he's not. And like Corey Lewandowski isn't going to tell him, Hey, go tell yeah. people the truth Probably about what's going on with feelings. you. Yeah. And, and like, and like there will be a non-trivial number of middle of the road voters who are just like, man, that guy is toughing it out. And I yeah. respect that. Uh, in, instead of whatever it is he's doing like i i don't want to give donald trump advice that he might follow yeah. that might help him in the yeah. election no, i don't but think like, he's listening to the 58 yeah. minute mark of this podcast uh <laughs> brian boitley you gotta i gotta let you go uh, thank you for you toughing it out um 16 years ago i'm glad you're here and um Thanks, buddy. you know thank you for being our head vibesologist and uh, we'll be back on the podcast soon all right uh, all right man Thanks to my friend Brian Boitler. We will be back on Monday. It's DNC Convention Week next week. We've got Bill Crystal on Monday, plus a Ukraine update. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to have some Democrats next week. So get ready for it. It's going to be great. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you all then. Peace. <laughs>